call the public work session scheduled for Tuesday, January 23rd, 2018 of the Portsmouth City Council to order. And Madam Clerk, would you call the roll? Please? Yes, sir. Mr. Clark? Here. Mrs. Lucas Burke? Here. Mr. Moody? Here. Ms. Simmons? Here. Mr. Smith? Here. Dr. Whitaker? Present. Mayor Rowe? Here. Dr. Patton? Yes. Mayor, Vice Mayor, and members of City Council, this evening, Mrs. Sherry Neal, our Intergovernmental Affairs Manager, will provide City Council with a brief update on the proceedings of the 2018 General Assembly session. This briefing will include an update on the City's legislative initiatives, as well as some information on a few key legislative and budgetary matters. The second presentation, Mr. James Wright, City Engineer, will present a Municipal Facilities Overview. <coughs> Members of City Council, many of the facilities in this presentation have been in limbo in regards to how to address the significant building issues and how to move forward. It is management desire through this presentation to allow you the opportunity to give you ample time to review and give some thought to your desires as it pertains to these buildings. We will have further discussion of uh, the Municipal Facilities Review at our City Council retreat. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, let's go to item one. The okay. You can put her on. I have. Okay. Mrs. Neal? <laughs> Unmute it. I did. Sherry? Yes, green light. Okay. Sherry? Sherry? Sherry. Yes, 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 I'm here. Okay, Mrs. Neal, I've made the introduction and now you can begin to speak with our city council. Thank you, Dr. Patton. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm so sorry we weren't able to look at one another this evening, but we'll work it out in <coughs> future meetings for sure. So, good evening, Mayor uh, Roll, Vice Mayor Simmons, members of council, and uh, uh, city manager and guests. Um, so this evening I'm going to give you a quick update on the going on of the General Assembly uh, so far. Today marks the 14th day of the 60-day session. Uh, it began on Wednesday the 10th with Governor Northam being inaugurated on Saturday the 13th. The outstanding House elections were all resolved, providing the Republican control of the House with a, a 51 to 49 uh, ratio. So 51 Republicans to 49 Democrats. Uh, House committee assignments were also made. To date, about 2,856 bills and resolutions have been submitted, out of which approximately 286 uh, have been sent to our city department head legislative context for their review and comment. Uh, budget amendments were all due on the 12th of January. The amendments became posted online uh, last Wednesday, the 18th and the money committee subcommittees have begun hearing the budget amendments of the non-money committee members as of last week. Uh, the week of February 5th through the 9th is when the House and the Senate money committees will begin deliberating on their respective budget, or well, subcommittees will begin uh, deliberating on their respective budget amendments. Uh, and their decisions are going to be made public on Sunday the 18th of February. Crossover is scheduled to begin on the 21st of February. Now, as for the city's legislative initiatives, this is your the update I have for you. Um, one of the first initiatives we had was our J Lock uh, study request to update the 1999 study for the policies, which was the focus on it. House Joint 60 uh, is Delegate James' bill, House Joint 105 is Delegate Heritage bill. Both of these House bills have been referred to the House Rules Subcommittee which meets on the call of the chairman, and the chairman is Delegate Knight. And Lucas also has a version of the, uh, the House, sorry, Senate version, hers is the Senate Joint 7, and that bill has been referred to the Senate Committee on Rules, which also meets at the call of the chair, <coughs> with Senator McDougall being the chair. <clears throat> the constitutional amendment abolishing forfeiture uh, voting rights by people convicted of felonies, uh, with Senator Lucas was carrying that, Senate Joint 5, this bill was referred to the Senate Committee on Privileges Elections and was heard on the 16th of January. Uh, the outcome is that constitutional amendments have to be introduced in the year that there is an intervening general election. Therefore, a bill was continued on to 2019 in the Privileges and Elections Committee. 
the historic African-American race tax request, uh, Delegate James has that, that's House Bill 527. The bill was assigned to the House Committee on Agriculture, Natural Resources, and Chesapeake Bay, Subcommittee Number 2, which meets on Wednesdays at 4 p.m. And this bill is scheduled to be heard tomorrow at 4 p.m. When? And tomorrow. tomorrow. At 4. And for Lucas's version of the bill, the Senate Bill 198, or Companion Bill, and this bill was assigned to, I'm sorry, Senator Locke has the companion bill. And that was assigned to the Senate Committee on General Laws and Technology, which meets on Mondays at about 45 minutes after the adjournment of the Senate session uh, up here at the Capitol. This bill is more than likely on their agenda for this coming Monday. We had another request dealing with the communications and sales and use tax, but we were not able to secure a picture from our delegation. However, the Virginia Municipal League and the Virginia Association of Counties are also working on this matter, and they were able to have Delegate Watts introduce the measure, so that's House Bill 1051. And this item is being heard tomorrow in the House Finance Subcommittee Number 2. We had a couple of budget amendments that were also requested. Um, the first well, 64000 in general funds over the next two years of the biennium was requested for the 266 African American historic grave sites in Portsmouth. 15000 each year, of that, 15000 each year uh, of the biennium was requested for routine annual maintenance, and 13400 each year of the biennium was requested to reset 67 stones at an average cost of $200 per stone and another 49,500 for each year of the biennium to repair 66 stones at an average cost of $750 per stone. Senator Locke, when Chief Kopech and Senator Lucas submitted the budget amendment for the Senate uh, request to call uh, company Senate Bill 198. Senator Locke spoke to her budget amendment before the Senate Finance Committee last Thursday, January the 18th. Delegate James submitted the same request to accompany his bill, House Bill 527. His budget item is budget item number 374, number 4H. We also requested a budget amendment for $5 million to increase the road impact payments to the host cities of the Virginia Port Authority. Those are being carried or were requested by Senator Lucas and Delegate James. Senator Lucas's budget item number is 461, number 1F. I was James budget item is 464 number 18. And lastly, while well, not in our package, we assisted the Hampton Roads Regional Jail securing co patrons for their budget <coughs> amendment. Delegate James has budget item 66 number 6H, which is requesting $2,441,752 to add 31 additional permanent positions at the regional jail. Senator Lucas also has in this uh, similar request on her budget item number 66, number 2F on the Senate side. The bridge loan we secured for the city last session to address the shortfall in the city's revenues from the new contract between the Virginia Port Authority and International Gateway remained in the governor's budget as item 453, subsection D is in Douglas for FY19 and FY20. We are monitoring this item to ensure that it remains in the budget. Uh, other bills of note that we are also working on appear in conjunction with uh, the other local government, the VA funds, VA, ML, and DACO. Uh, there's a bill in for pretrial services. They want to eliminate pretrial services in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, there's one bill for that, and there's another bill requesting a study on pretrial services. We're working on that. There's an omnibus transit bill that come out, and it's an administration bill that's being worked on. Um, that's heavily geared toward Northern Virginia, even though there is a gas floor tax that's included in there for Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads. Um, issue with that mainly is that we cannot use the gas floor tax um, for transit because of House Bill 2313. So even though when they finish massaging this particular piece of uh, legislation, we'll get some money out of it for probably operations costs, maybe capital costs for the um, HRT, but we won't get anything specifically to help the transit for our area. Um, Senator Lucas's casino bills were up uh, yesterday, and they were both uh, 
TV, I passed by and definitely the committee. And then we have the wireless bill, um, relay, as it relates to rezone to zoning authority that we are working on in, uh, up here. Um, any questions? Any questions? Anybody? Uh, tell us the logis logistics for VML Day on January the 31st. I think uh, there are some of us who are going from City Council. If yes, I am. I have meetings set up starting at. Well, you can you can nine o'clock, nine thirty to ten o'clock with the legislators, with our delegation, and at noon, the Junior First Cities is having their meeting, um, which we are invited to, which they're also serving lunch at the meeting. And I needed a head count as to who might be coming up for those meetings. Um, and then I believe at three o'clock is when the VML program begins at the Library of Virginia. We are operating out of temporary facilities, as you know, located at 900 East Main Street. When you come up in the morning and uh, go to visit with the legislators, that's where they'll be at. If you're going to attend any of the committee meetings that may be up that day, they'll be between the 900 East Main Street and up the hill in the Capitol building. Um, Virginia First Cities is hosting their meeting a block and a half down on Main Street. Um, so that's not far. And then to get to the um, VML uh, event, then you have to walk up the hill to the Library of Virginia at 9th and Board. Okay. Any questions from Council? All right. Well, thank you very much. Be safe. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Patton, can we go to item two? Yes, uh, Ms., uh, Mr. James Wright will come forward with the um, municipal facilities overview. We'll give Mrs. White a second to get the presentation up. We will get back with uh, Mrs. Neal uh, to, to deal with the time. I know. We'll do that in the morning. <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of City Council. This presentation will provide an overview of recent assessments and proposed CIP projects for several of the buildings throughout the city. You will get a snapshot of the types of issues that are encountered when certain maintenance activities are deferred. Significant building projects will be prevalent in future CIP discussions, both short and long term. Please keep the following in mind as we go through this presentation. The city has an older stock of buildings. The majority of the 70 plus buildings maintained by properties management are more than 45 years old. Each one experienced issues with one or more of its major systems. The first building overview is 801 Water Street. This building is 35 years old and, it ha and its current use is for the police administration. 801 Water Street is a five-story office building with a parking deck below. It is a twin building to City Hall. The buildings are similarly constructed and experience similar issues where maintenance is deferred on significant building components. A comprehensive building evaluation was performed by Clark Nexon. Their analysis included life safety analysis, building shell analysis, review of the fire alarm and fire suppression systems, mechanical system review, and an examination of the flood protection requirements for the existing fire pump and generator. The costs shown in this slide are to address only those building systems issues. No renovation or rehabilitation is included in those costs. Um, Mayor, as he goes through, I think if you have any questions or anything, we'd like to raise them. One of the things I'd like for Mr. Um, right to share is how these buildings were designed and he shared that with me that the buildings these two buildings were not designed to be so go based from there. so based on our research and just looking through uh, some of the issues they're having and looking back at some of the, the construction techniques were used neither neither 
the 801 Water Street or the current City Hall building were intended to be permanent waterfront structures. So they have a shorter lifespan than your typical than your typical building. I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, when you said it was they were not intended to be um, waterfront buildings, uh, how long has that been known? Um, we've just been going through this research and just recently come to this conclusion based on looking at the different problems associated with both buildings and then going back through different plans. What I, well, I guess I'll ask it a different way. Uh, what you're reporting that that building is not a sound structure to be on waterfront property? No, no sir. No I'm saying each one of these buildings is close to the end of its useful life where okay. you would, they're only 35 years old. You anticipate most buildings to get 50 to 60 years out of the building before they get to that point. Okay. These buildings are progressively, there's faster because they were built using different techniques, so they're not there. Okay. They're not there yet, and, so. and what was the, what was the cost of that building? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, so the, well, the cost the, of the building the or? The city purchased that. I don't know if you have that information. No, I don't have that information. Well, could you speak to the, what does the pyramid wall does anyone, is? Does anyone know how much we paid for that building? Oh, when it was built? But, well, that was purchased, wasn't that purchased from a private owner? He's asking for I, the, I mo the most recent, just recently came into city's possession, so right. we can get that information for you. Could you explain what the parapet wall is that, that we have a good picture? So before you leave that okay. slide, uh, Bill's got a question. Yeah. So on the uh, on the building, what uh, when was the last time any of these things were performed? Uh, I take it this would fall into the deferred maintenance category. Yes, sir. So. Nothing has really been spent as far as maintenance. Well, traditionally, um, over the years, it's been when a significant issue arises, the project arises out of that significant issue. There, to our research, there hasn't been a, a robust inspection routine to sort of catch these issues before they become significant. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So the eight million dollars for the building system issues; those are the significant issues. Are there the insignificant issues that are factored into the eight million that's there? They're not mentioned. There's some smaller issues in there, but this is just to keep get the building back to a state where you don't have these issues. So there's no renovation of space. There's no remodeling in that. This is just the the building shell, which is the exterior, the roof, the foundation. Um, the HVAC systems and any of those other components um, in the building that, that make up the, the main guts of the building. And considering the 35 years, the eight million would help fix it back to another how long? No. No, that's not. That's not. That's so this, yeah. <laughs> no. Okay. That eight million will just address these major things. Nothing inside that would need to be done to the building is included in the eight million. So it's not worth it. To so if you want to go in and program that and have finish the build out or do whatever, that's that cost didn't address in there. So whatever the program is for a building as such as this that you want to do, that that's not in that cost right there. Mm -hmm. So this is just building components. So so that's not expanding that's not expanding the useful life of the right. building. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So presently, the police administration is the only entity in the building? Police administration is in there. There's and then one there's division a, um, for the sheriff. The sheriff has um, one office in there for their files. But um, uh, I will be talking with um, the new sheriff, and there may be room in there for Mrs. Wimbley in the courthouse, in the sheriff's space. So um, what is the occupancy of the building as far as percent occupied? The, oh, oh, it's so the, you have individuals on the first floor, you have individuals on the second floor, the third floor, okay. third and fourth, um, kind of so about what, 35 percent maybe? So, so how are you going to move um, departments or you mentioned we're not, in we're the, not, we're, we're, we're not, not we're showing you right now um, the condition of the buildings. At some point, um, and um, 
we are doing a public safety facilities, what are we doing right now with? So we're doing a you were doing a fire department a fire station facility study, with the major with the significant component of that being to look at the proposed location for the new trucks or fire station, mm -hmm. but that's also examining the other eight fire stations as well and looking at the building condition of those and some other things as far as how they deliver their service. It's a complete comprehensive report uh, for the fire department. And we're coming back to recommend uh, the same kind of report and consideration for um, starting the process for a new public safety building that would be police. But that's not done right now, not in here. We're just looking at the city-owned buildings and what is talking about to structures today. Just structures that city owned. Still. Uh, what, what uh, I guess my question is, what are you looking for as far as feedback from council? Uh, are you going to come back with a uh, 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 prioritized list, or do you want us to? Well, I think the decision has to, the, the decision has, to, we're, sh the intent tonight is sh to show you what are the issues that are facing cities' facilities that have cost factors to them. There has to be a decision made on where do we go, what do we do. I understand, but you will be coming back later. Oh, yeah, we're going to have discussion. Yeah, we're going to be having a component okay. of this at the... Um, this is just bombard us with information. This is, you're going to have the information that you're going to be able to have in your hand for further discussion and want you to give some thought to what you're hearing tonight. Okay. That's what the purpose of okay. this is, okay. not to make a decision on anything. Right. Dr. Whitaker. Well, where does this fit in the grand scheme of things as far as developing the waterfront? It's, it's a part of development of the waterfront. If we, if we move forward on development of the waterfront and we, we being, there's a developer that comes in and wants to develop the waterfront, then we must begin the process to understand what do we do moving forward with city hall, police, and those kinds of things. And that's going to be a, a presentation we're going to make uh, coming forward of um, in, in a piece that we're working on right now. But this would be a building that would be available for... Whatever somebody want to buy it. Whatever they want to do. Yes, I, I know the discussion is coming later, but just, you know, with the information we've been given tonight, the cost of just bringing the structure back without anything else, you know, it seems to me that we need to start working on an exit strategy to move this building elsewhere right. that way because all the infrastructure with this, just like we've always talked about the jail being on waterfront property, yes. the infrastructure is all connected with all of them. So if we made that exit plan, then you're all of that property would be available to be marketed at the same time. That's You're going to hear from the, you're okay. going to hear that in a couple of weeks. Right. We're already working, been working for months. Right. Okay. I see it as a, a future capital uh, needs. It's something that we need to be looking at long term. A lot of this is long term because That's of cost, right. and I think it'll, it will, it could affect each budget as we go forward. Some of these projects will, and it will be we start here next year, five years from now, whomever we keep it going till we get it done. But that's that's the purpose here, not to be in limbo anymore, but know strategically how we're going to move to get to where we want to go. I think Mr. Moody mentioned last night we got things that we people continue to ask, but how are we moving them? And this is the right. moving them discussion starting. Right. Okay. Change. Go on. Yeah. So, 801 Crawford Street is City Hall. Um, as, previously, as noted previously, it's a twin building to 801 Water Street. Staff observations confirm that there are similar issues present in this building as with its twin building. Specifically, this includes mechanical repairs and replacement, flood protection recommendations, and the generator analysis. Clark Nexon performed an analysis and design for the IT data center, fire suppression, and mechanical upgrades. McPherson Design has inspected and provided design specifications for past repair work and ongoing projects in the parking garage. The cost shown in this slide will address only those building system issues shown on the slide. Okay. okay. Will it haul? Willett Hall is a 45,000 square foot performing arts venue that can accommodate 1,924 people. 
numerous consultants and staff members have provided observations, analysis, and reviews over the past 10 to 15 years. Most recently, the Livis Group performed a comprehensive building evaluation and Pace Collaborative evaluated the mechanical systems. The Livis task included an evaluation of the overall site and landscaping, analysis of the architecture, both exterior and interior, structural condition, mechanical systems at a high level, roofing, theater, sounds and acoustics, water damage remission control, and hazardous materials and termite damage. The renovation and rehabilitation costs for this facility are comparable to those for a new facility. Okay, Craddock Community Center. This building is 53, year, 53 years old and currently not in use. It is a one-story community building in Afton Square. It has not been used in approximately five years. It is a small facility with significant issues. The building is in its current condition is not suitable for community programming. If reuse is intended, a full analysis should be performed as part of the design for the renovation to include a building shell analysis, which is the structural systems, mechanical systems, ADA, access ADA accessibility requirements based on the intended use, life safety systems, and an update of any environmental analysis that's been previously performed. And the cost that you see that are 1.2 million, it includes the building systems and the interior rehabilitation. Okay, the Porcelain Pavilion. Porcelain Pavilion is the, is the entertainment venue for the city. The trailers used for dressing rooms and production are temporary buildings that were not intended for long-term use. The roofs were replaced in the past few years, but several areas have water damage from the previous leaks. The spaces also have problems associated with buckling and warped floors. The solution should include replacing the trailers with modest masonry block buildings. The stage, rigging, the stage, rigging, and several passageways also require attention. It is recommended that this facility should have a routine inspection scheduled after each season, along with a standard comprehensive inspection every three years. Currently, the tent structure is inspected annually by Span Systems. If I could stay there for a minute. I remember we were talking today, just reviewing the presentation. When we opened the facility in 2001, um, and the, the, the pavilion was finished, but we needed the offices for Bill Reed, I think that was his name, to get in. So we immediately found these trailers. But the trailers were to be temporary, and there were to be plans to build the permanent masonry offices and things but 16 years later we have not and so with the, the we've done continuously over the years reflooring because you know it's thin wood and um, cost to just trying to repair these trailers that life cycle probably was what 10 years if that if that okay Okay, the former court complex and civic center. So, um, current use, city jail and police records are over in this facility. Um, the site has been, has been identified in several studies and planning documents as key property for conversion if the redevelopment of downtown waterfront is to occur. Planning and analysis will be necessary for the redevelopment of this parcel as it relates to downtown waterfront strategies. Um, the cost you see there for the jail, re jail relocation is actually for a, a new pod at the regional jail. And then the demolition costs were updated um, using means data and some uh, demolition, demolition costs. Just we have. the jail or the whole Demolition of the whole site. Uh, well, some of those mechanical systems are uh, also what shared with the, uh, uh, with the 801. Cool. Yes, sir. Or with 60, with 601. Not 601. Yes, yes, sir. Is that taken in consideration on that eight million dollars? The demo, the demolition is the whole complex. Okay, the whole. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. okay. That whole um, platform. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. The uh, the 64 million. You said that that figure involves what? That was for the, the figure that we uh, 
got out of a study. It's about three years old, and it's for a new pod at the regional jail. When you say a pod, what are you? It's a new wing. A whole new wing. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. How many, how many cells would that be? I think you can get 700 in, this, in the pod. How many in a pod? The pod is, is designed for pod like Pod is like 250, something, yes. 250, yes. 250, 300, something like that. Well, I remember we were talking at one of the last regional jail meetings that some of them had 110 or 120, but they weren't designed for that, and there's two sides mm. and then a second floor. So it's not that many. And, you know, I know that the – I don't know the current population of the jail, but I believe it's under 200 in the city jail. But I don't – but even with that number and the beds we have at regional jail, we have over 2,800 and some outstanding warrants in the city. And the other, I guess one of the concerns is at the last regional jail meeting, it was brought to our attention that the regional jail was not designed for and is not an intake facility as Western Tidewater. So our police officer could not arrest somebody and take them straight to the Hampton Roads Regional Jail. That's why they want us to handle each locality to do the initial mental and physical assessments before they're transferred to the regional jail. So, you know, it's designed now, that can't be, it's not designed for our police officers to make an arrest and take them directly to the regional jail. So that's something that has to be looked into. If, yes, sir. I think the idea is to have our own self-contained facility everywhere jail and everything in that part I, that's what my understanding that's I know some people have said that but that's not how the regional jail works right. if it's an additional pod it's theirs our, our deputies our sheriff has nothing to do with other than being a member of the board that we sit on so it's not ours even though it's it's there no. could could it be could the uh, regional be altered to accept uh, intake that is a possibility because Western Tidewater Regional Jail that's in Suffolk, they have intake. For example, the city of Suffolk does not have a city of jail, neither does Isle of Wight County. When their deputies or police officers make an arrest, they do take them to that facility as an intake facility. It's just as it is now, it's not an intake facility. Would there, there may be enough room to have our own freestanding in that without a pod is connected yeah but if, if it was disconnected and we had our own facility there that would probably be the better option than falling up under the regional jail if we had our own facility and I, I like that idea having our own facility but I don't think it would go on their property I think we'd have to put it somewhere different than their property there's a factor of state funding too yes state yeah. will fund 50 percent for regional jails and only 25 percent for standalone mm -hmm. local jails we do believe, Mayor, we, and I kind of shared this with you before, we took the lead in the mental health grant, which uh, was awarded to six um, jails across the state, and ours was the first award. And we have been um, uh, approved for a renewal of that, um, of that grant. And, and we, with our behavioral health care uh, and working with the jail, have made great strides in working with the mental, um, they have over 800 mental ill patients there, as reported in our uh, meeting. With that said, and we, 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 knowing that the state is focusing on the Hampton Roads Regional Jail because it has the most uh, persons with disabilities in any other jail in the state, that at some point the state will have to build a new pod, we are thinking, down the road. And if they build a new pod just for ment the mental uh, challenges that they have there, that may free up some space out there that the city can, in fact, since we are the lead in getting the grant, have the first rights on if, if they build a new pod. But this is down the road. It's not tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But that was our intent of going forward and being one of the leads in it, and that is in our proposal of which we submitted to them the need for having a separate, right now they've kind of transitioned, but we'd like to see them have a separate pod for those who are challenged. Yes, sir. But after my, my tenure on council, we were talking about this. Um, there ought to be some type of direction established as to, you know, where, we, where we're gonna go. That's right. And because that, jail needs to come down. That's what we're working toward. We're coming back to you to tell you what 
the plans are, mm -hmm. but this is the beginning with the buildings, what the recommendations are. And, and you're right, it, 32 years here, we've been talking about moving the jail. What's Nate, is there uh, vacancies at the regional jail now? I'm not sure our beds, the... Uh, not so much for Portsmouth, but is there unused capacity at the regional jail? I don't believe so because some of the pods are, some of the max security pods are, are actually housing more inmates than they're designed for. And as we were talking with Sherry Neal speaking about the uh, budget amendment that Matthew James, Delegate James, put in for $2.4 million is to bring extra staff because as it stands now with the population in the jails, at that Hannah Rhodes Regional Jail, there's not enough staff. So it's actually, this time, it's dangerous for the correctional officers as well as the individuals housed in there. And that's what, you know, started that budget amendment of the 2.4 million to bring it back to a safer facility. No. Um, and uh, I know the Western, <coughs> Western Regional Jail, which can accommodate intake, uh, they, uh, you know, I think I shared that with some of you. Uh, that they have quite a few vacancies that uh, we, we could certainly utilize on a temporary basis. I, I think it was over 200 mm -hmm. uh, uh, that they'd be willing to uh, to accommodate. And I think the price was the Goodbye. same price that uh, they charged the federal inmates, which pretty seemed pretty Goodbye. reasonable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just, one last Just something question. to think about. The, um, the rules and regulations regarding the intake process now with that I know it's not a council level uh, authority so the regional so would all the cities have to buy into that um, change <laughs> no because to have that would be fall under Department of Corrections if they were intake facility mm -hmm. but it wouldn't make as much sense for it to be an intake facility for the other participating jurisdictions as it was for us mm -hmm. because it's in our jurisdiction because Norfolk Chesapeake Hampton and Newport News still have running city jails that I don't see them closing anytime soon. So if it was made an intake, it would probably be for our benefit specifically. Yes, sir. Mayor, in uh, speaking or meeting with uh, our new sheriff, he indicated there were 70 beds vacant when he took office, mm -hmm. and he indicated that he would fill all of the beds. The last report, which was last week, he indicated that um, he had um, uh, move <coughs> two floors in the, the city jail right now that are vacant, mm -hmm. being that he has shifted <coughs> and moved some people. My question was overall capacity. I, of this jail? No, oh, of, of region, the regional okay. jail. Okay, we'll, we'll have to get that. I'm curious, as you, um, <laughs> as you look at capacity, um, do we ever um, look at the capacity in other local jails as far as um, using uh, their vacancy? So, that was just what Mr. Moody had called to uh, our attention, and I shared with the mayor that I think it's Mr. Dumas. I think he's talking about Western Tidewater. Yeah, he's talking about yeah. Western Tidewater. No, I'm talking yeah. about the localities like Norfolk, no, like Norfolk, Chesapeake, Hampton, that No, we hadn't, we hadn't looked at them. The, lo the city jails, we had not looked at them for capacity because most of those jails are, are very, very crowded. When when we reported that Portsmouth had... That's why they're in the regional jail. Right. That's why they... When we reported, we had 190-something <coughs> in our jail. I think the others were saying, well, we got 1,000, we got 900. So the jails across the region, well, not regional jail, their they're city jails are booked. Well, I'm, I'm not sure because you just said that Portsmouth has 70 vacancies. Um, what I'm saying is that the new sheriff is going to use all of the regional jail beds. They were not all used by the last administration. I, I think one of the things that can be slightly confusing is Portsmouth at this time, we have 250 beds in the regional jail that we pay for whether there's an inmate in that bed or not. But that doesn't reflect on the total population of the regional jail whether there's more bodies there than should be because that 250 number we're paying for but that doesn't necessarily mean that those empty beds are really empty beds because some of the pods are overpopulated and the cells aren't designed to have that many people in them. and if i understood you correctly you're saying that they're understaffed yeah. Yes, very yeah. under, very understaffed. For the current population. Well, yeah. the yes, they they have some vacancies and they have some that, are, that actually started the academy beginning of this month, but 
even if they were full staff, they're understaffed based on the conditions. And a lot of that comes from, you know, we keep getting updates on the extreme medical costs and all these issues. Every time individuals transported to the hospital, they have to take a correctional officer out to stand guard on them in the hospital. And as they start doing transportations, they start losing the numbers of the shift. So that's that's what started that bill to increase the number of correctional officers to solve some of these safety issues. Most a lot of sick. I don't want to ignore anybody over here. Okay. Okay, um, the social services building. Generally, the building is in good condition. The existing customer service areas and workspace require renovations so that social services can continue to provide quality service. Replacement of the carpet on the fourth floor is complete. The first floor carpet replacement is scheduled for this fiscal year. The roof and the rooftop HVAC units also need to be replaced. And I saw you looking at the scan, so that's the infrared scan of the roof. And the, the dark red to the lighter red shows different levels of saturation, the yellow being that that is severely saturated portion of the roof. And then the lower picture is the outline of that area. Now, the building, we are still, um, we will not own the building until 20... Two years, another two years, another two years. <coughs> um, and so it, it, it appeared that over the years, the, the particularly with the air condition, air condition started as a problem almost year two. Um, well, close to right, right, right year two, without being able to get parts and different things. But that building needs an entire new roof and an air conditioning system. <laughs> <laughs> so who, who owns it now? The state? No, the state doesn't own it. It was a, a it was a, public private. Yeah, public private. Some kind of. I don't know who. I was. A, I don't know who it is, but I can find it out for you. So whoever owns it isn't responsible. No, for in it? the agreement, the city was to take care of all of the maintenance. Why don't you send us a summary of that relationship? Would I should. That be helpful. Okay. Just so we will know. Yes, I will get that to you. Mm -hmm. Keep going. And Sportsplex. Um, the gymnasium at the Sportsplex will have a soft opening next week. The remaining buildings at the Sportsplex, the classroom, dormitory, cafeteria, greenhouse, and there's a small auxiliary building, all have various environmental issues and are not suited for current programming. Based on recent experience with renovations of various buildings across the city, demolition is recommended for these buildings. Moreover, the demolition of these buildings remove a potential hazard immediately adjacent to the recreational parcel that is being developed. The renovated gymnasium and the proposed athletic fields, walking trail, and associated parking in the future site improvements that are being funded through, CD, through the community block development program. So that uh, kind of going back to our original uh, plans for the sportsplex was that uh, 30 acres you know give or take uh, 28 points uh, yeah right at 30 mm -hmm. uh, is that on our list uh, possible to to sell that and what, recoup some of the investment that we've made out at uh, the sportsplex here's what uh, we did in 2015 right when I uh, came into the city we carved out 10 acres for recreation, which would include, and we're looking down the road, which would include enough uh, acreage for what he just described that we're going for to fund in the CDBG. It also includes enough land for a swimming pool in that plan of the 10 acres. That would leave an additional 20 acres for development or whatever it is that um, the possibilities are. So 10 acres of property, as we charge that <coughs> is a lot of property to get on that property, a very robust recreation um, site. And then it would leave, and, we, and I think, Mr., it's like 28.9 or almost, almost 30 acres of land out there. A new swimming pool, I, I thought we uh, redid the existing pool. That swimming pool was built in the 50s, Mr., that's just almost like a water hole. It's as old as um, Cavalier Manor's pool that was built in the 60s. And we put quite a bit of money in that? Uh, I don't no, know. Sir. They, they did the inspection and fence. got it back up and running and put a new fence, fence around, around it. That's all. 
it's still the it same. pretty good. I, I was out there last summer. Looked pretty it's good. It's a to small. Me. It's it's not a. <laughs> yeah, it's the original pool from whenever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then the last building is the main library. Um, during significant rainfall events, the library experiences flooding in several areas on the lower floor. The exterior was evaluated by the McPherson Design Group to determine how water was getting into the facility. Plans and specifications for recommended repairs are under review by city staff. Additional repairs and renovations to the lower level will be requ required once the water infiltration problem is fixed. And that, that cost is just for those structural repairs related to the infiltration, not the <coughs> renovation of the, the space afterwards. How's the roof on that building? Um, it appears to be intact when they did the determine where the water was coming from. There was no mention of the roof, just some, some masonry issues. So. Is the library considered a historical yeah. landmark? Yes, sir. Are there any grant funds or anything available for that? I'm sure we can look I don't and think see. we've researched. Right, we can look and see, Ms. Dr. Whitaker, we have not. There may be some opportunities that we will do that, we'll report back. Now, Dr. Patton, you yeah. said that uh, you were going to divide this presentation into two parts. Yes. The night and the retreat. Yes. And the retreat will cover a more, uh, a deeper discussion. A deeper discussion, building? yes. A deeper discussion and... Um, a deeper discussion and um, a presentation on the vision that we have to address, as has been asked, what are you planning if somebody comes and want to take these two buildings? What are the plans? How, where, 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 how do we move this unfolded year, say three to five years out? I think it would be useful to know, too, the condition of the various recreational facilities like Cavalier Manor. Yeah. Let me tell you why I pulled that out because um, that was in there but I said to Mr. and I said to Ms. Furlow that's I want to present that but I want to present that by itself. I didn't want that to get mixed up in these municipal buildings because that's one in and of itself so we have that and we can we can include that mm -hmm. in another. We're going to have a lot of these kinds of presentations as we work toward a budget. Public safety buildings like fire stations throughout the city? Yes. We 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 uh we've got that. Okay. Well, you're going to hear it all. And that's going to be at the retreat. The or, retreat is or go later. It's going to be the retreat is going to be um, the Crawford. What is the name we've given it? <coughs> Crawford Gateway Revitalization Station, Plan, which would include these buildings, the jails, property over there that we own, all of that laid out so that you can see it all and those kinds of discussions. So a discussion about how to displace these buildings, replace them someplace else. Yes. And then how to make them available for yes. development. Yes, yes. This is leading. Oh, yes. Sounds okay. like a good discussion. Okay. Any questions? And those questions that were asked, um, we'll get that information back to you. <clears throat> we were told um, in Cavalier Manor that y'all were going to study that. Had that been done? Uh, study. Study what? The facilities that. That's that that facility has been assessed. Yes, sir. Okay. That's going to be in this right. just recreation. Okay. So that total list. <coughs> this is just the the, the um, municipal buildings. The, the major. Yeah, quality. major municipal facilities. But we're going to have. We're going to have, uh, we're going to have municipal. We're going to have recreation facilities on next Thursday night, the 25th. The schools are presenting mm -hmm. school facilities. That's this Thursday. So. Yeah, this coming Thursday. Yeah. Right. And we're all invited. Mm -hmm. It's at 5:30. Yes. I remember. In the council yeah. chambers. Yes. Yeah. It's it's the school board's meeting, but yeah. council. I would really encourage you to be there to hear yeah. this mm -hmm. this report. Absolutely. And if you can come, it would be really great to, to hear. And, and I might add, uh, thanks to council and and city manager, funds are already have been and are being expended in Cavalier Manor to bring it up in phases. Yeah, we've been working out there. Um, in addition, um, while we're talking about the schools, after the facilities study is presented, um, Dr. Bracey and I, in talking, uh, would like to s s 
set up a time where we could have um, council persons two, two, two to visit some of the schools that you're going to hear about in that presentation. I um, visited schools with Dr. Bracey, those that he wanted me to see, and I said to him, definitely council needs to go out and see these schools. Not going to be many, but I would love for you to do that. We would like to schedule it. Now, this facility is very much back office, but the compound, do we need to be talking about that? Well, um, it, it, in your in the public utilities uh, budget, the design and build of a not not the waste management building not the the waste management building is in is is in design. Correct. They're right. currently designing the replacement that something that's for the waste current working. waste management building. But the other part we have a the we have not looked at Mayor. We could the prefab buildings. No, some of those buildings, I don't know how long they've been out there. But they <coughs> That's my point. I mean, right. I think we need the same analysis. Right. We can do that. And what if we moved? I mean, it's at a major gateway to our city. That's right exactly at an interchange. Right. It doesn't make sense to have that there forever and ever. And where in the world would you put it? We don't know. We got. Um, we can think. Yeah. We can where dream. It will be building. a question like the jail. Yeah. Yeah. We could dream. <laughs> we could dream. So, Mayor, that we can begin that work on that. That's a quarter right on 264. Yeah. Well, including a new jail, that list that we just went over is, uh, exceeds $100 million. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. We know that all cannot be done, but yeah. the start of where, and we're looking 30 years, 20 years. I mean, something's going to be immediate, next five to 10 years. But. As you prepare us for this discussion, can you refresh the availability of state funding for jails? We can. What that process is, mm -hmm. and what, how long is the queue for state <coughs> Is it a short line, a long line? Mm -hmm. uh, getting that down okay and we, we review every meeting and take okay. and when we start you know we start looking at jail i'd be you know interested you know we'll have discussions with sheriff moore and some of that because there's a lot involved with people don't see what happens every day like when the new courthouse opened in september 2012 that created a transport mm -hmm. issue that every day you transport approximately mm -hmm. 40 inmates from the jail to the courthouse because they have court and you know that's kind of a you have to do it on the fly because you have some people that can't be in contact with each other of course you have to have you know if you got a female they can't be with males and there's a, a lot that goes on it's only a mile away from the current jail to to that courthouse but it's a <coughs> issue that happens every day and it's never the same twice and you know same thing with regional jail the courts have to rely on hampton roads regional jail to get individuals from there to court, but unfortunately they don't have the sense of urgency to get people to the court because they're doing it for every locality that they're housed <coughs> in. You know, the optimum thing would be, don't know if it's possible beyond me, but you know, of course we probably would never need to jail this size or the maximum security as the current Portsmouth City Jail, but if you could put a facility somehow behind the courthouse, I don't know if that's ever possible, but then you would cut out that transportation aspect. You're not driving them back and forth every day. You could have secured catwalks where you physically walk them from one building to the next, and that would be the optimum for security, security of the individual, security of the public, and you know complement the courthouse itself because that's how it was at the old complex where there was we called them tunnels it was just going through the basement secure facilities to get them from the jail to the courthouse mm -hmm. you know and that would be an optimum thing if we had secure catwalks to connect the two and that's just like we said we can dream about certain things right. don't know if it's possible but i think that would be the optimum place to put a facility would be right behind it where it could be connected to the courthouse to, to facilitate those daily operations. <laughs> right. I guess the only issue with that is this waterfront, isn't it? Mm -hmm. No, no, it's separated between Ocean Marine. The parking lot is between the current jail, the rear parking lot is between the courthouse, and then Ocean Marine is behind it. So it's not on waterfront. You know, the thought is the parking lot is already there, you know, thinking if you could elevate it, you can maintain parking below and have the structure elevated and have elevated catwalks to the courthouse. That way you don't have to transport people 
in the public. You know, they could but transport them. That extra space you're talking about is vacant, though. Yes. It's currently a parking lot right now. Vacant space yeah. and a park. You yes. Know, the park yeah. is right so all, in the that, all that other space will be used to support the jail and that. I'm, I'm well, it's, it's all for the courthouse now, but it would be, it would just come, it, it would basically be a combination like similar to the past of courthouse and a jail facility that's connected. And a parking deck. And, and yes. my, my point is, it's, it's not a bad idea, I think so too. especially when there's not much you can do with what's left. Right. Sure. Right. Sure. Just there. You know, about 15 years ago, we had a blue ribbon uh, panel. Uh, to discuss the, the jail and some of those problems of uh, relocation, uh, expense, state funding. Okay. Might not be a bad idea, uh, Mayor, if uh, we, we would do that again, because all those figures from 15 years ago, you, you, you know, might as well throw them out of the door. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, and, and get some people that can focus on it uh, uh, much more in depth than this council meets uh, and has time to do. Might, and get some people with that expertise on that panel. Just a suggestion. We have a copy uh, of the um, old uh, documents that we have looked at. Can you um, make a PDF copy and send it to us? Be, we uh, could. We could. It's a because of the magnitude big document. Of that, you don't need a jail retreat. A jail retreat. Okay. But Bill does have a point. I mean, mm -hmm. there are voices that need to be in this room, like yeah. the sheriff, yeah. the magistrate, right. Uh, right. Yeah. We'll the get, Commonwealth we'll, Attorney. Right. When we get to that point, you know, we would have we'll to have those. Yeah. This yeah. is just this right. just preliminary. Yeah. Just Court some services. conversation. Just yeah. talk. Just conversation. No, it's not. It's more talk. And we we move it. <laughs> but we had this okay. talk. Yeah. Right. 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 Any other All questions? right. So the next time we discuss this will be at our retreat. Yes. The retreat comes before the next council yes. meeting. Yes. The retreat is second, third. The council meeting is the 12th and 13th. And when you. 12th and 13th, February. When you talk about recreational facilities, that includes Port Norfolk. We're talking about all, we had them all. Mm -hmm. We had the pictures and everything. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Any other questions or comments? No. Good discussion. All right. You want me to go to the next meeting? Yes. Okay. Uh, Mayor, members of council, we have four um, city manager report items on the agenda for tonight. The first is adoption of an ordinance accepting aid to locality funds in the amount of $319,387 from the Virginia Department of Fire Programs and appropriating said funds to the FY 2018 grant fund for the use by the fire uh, and rescue and emergency services. Um, and this program does not require any um, uh, cash match from the city. The next one is an adoption of an ordinance accepting a grant for $19,544 from the Virginia Department of Criminal Justice Services and appropriating said amount in the FY 2018 grants fund for use by the Portsmouth <coughs> Community Criminal Justice Board to conduct comprehensive planning. The third is an adoption of an ordinance to amend section 1099 of chapter 10 of the code of the city of Portsmouth, Virginia, 2006, to change the voting location from precinct number 14 from Emily in Spawn Preschool to Brighton Elementary School location at 1100 Portsmouth Boulevard. Dr. Patton. Yes, sir. I, I'd like to inform council that um, the Lord Short called me to let me know that she has a conflict and couldn't be here, but the reason for it, the way she explained it to me, Emily Spong preschool building is closed, so it's no longer available as a precinct. Um, although the Brighton School is new, it's actually a little bit out of that, out of that precinct, but still it's within the uh, distance. Mm -hmm. And so that's the reason for this. Mm -hmm. And I told her that I would tell you all. That's parking, you know. Yeah, sure. Yeah. The, the last item on the city manager's report tonight is adoption of an ordinance authorizing the transfer of 175000 from the non-departmental salary allowance for salary savings line item in the FY 2018 general fund budget to the non-departmental benefits retiree supplement line item in the FY 2018 general fund budget for the purpose of funding a one-time supplement in the gross amount of $500 to beneficiaries under the Portsmouth Supplemental Retirement 
system and the fire and police retirement system who did not receive the one-time supplement authorized by ordinance 2017-103 adopted by city council in November 28, 2017. Um, I have three um, items of report back and two are um, actually uh, the same topic. Um, an update on Frederick Boulevard, of which um, we are aware of the uh, work that's going on there. It's just the VDOC project. This is the VDOC project. Um, um, VDOC is the, and uh, Mr. Wright, stand to the podium, please. VDOC, VDOC is the overarching guide on the project, but there's also um, HRSD, who's a part of it. Uh, and with that said, the question came up uh, from one of the um, city council community meetings. Why doesn't VDOT work on the Term Park project at night? Mm -hmm. And um, so we're answering that back in a report back, and I'll let Mr. Yeah. Uh, speak let's, to that. Let's hear that orally. Okay. So, um, <laughs> I, I can, okay. you know, <laughs> I'll take it. But uh, so the um, so Virginia Department of Transportation has their internal rule where um, they don't advertise for a project if all the funds allocated aren't in place uh, related to the construction estimate. Well, um, when this project got to the point where it's ready to be advertised, they didn't have the funding that they had was less than what was in the estimate. So um, when you were city manager, you wrote a letter in uh, April of 2014 to the commissioner uh, let them know how important that this project was to the city um, and that we already had uh, significant funds on that project from the city's perspective as far as $1.1 million of revenue sharing, um, our share for urban funds, um, that VDOT should find the, those funds which were just under $4 million, $3.78 million that they were short. So they found those funds and they advertised for the project. Uh, when they received those first bids, uh, they were in excess of those funds, so they had to go back and do a project rework. Um, the second advertisement, um, they went at, they were, the bids came in and they were able to award the project. Um, that being said, the contingency on the project is limited. So um, with that being said, their nighttime work is expensive, very expensive. With already limited contingency funds, it's unlikely that those that there would be funds available for actually for them to do nighttime work. And then nighttime work comes with its own um, degree of challenges. And some of those challenges are um, at least that intersection and where they're working right now is adjacent to residential as well as commercial. And so you'd have people working at night um, in close proximity to residential. Um, typically, if you have an emergency situation, they're more difficult to deal with at night. Um, there let, there's less traffic on the road at night, and so cars tend to go a little faster, so that sometimes can put, potentially put workers at hazard situations. And so there's all kinds of other things that get involved with night, to do with night work, and one of the biggest right now is just that contingency factor with the cost and them being in close proximity so to uh, the residences. Are we uh, communicating uh, with uh, Mr. Marange, uh with... Uh, Kroger corporate uh, because they, uh, they I furnished his uh, email uh, they're they're extremely concerned with, with the length of time in fact uh, they had told me they're losing approximately 250,000 a month uh, because of this project and I, I don't know how much more VDOT would charge but uh, that's been the project that just goes on forever, and, and I know it's you know perhaps <coughs> nobody's fault, right. but the fact is that uh, their business is, is being severely damaged. And we have approached, uh, in fact, Mr. Um, Wright had a discussion as because the question was asked, will VDOC pay the companies for what they say they're losing, and the. Uh, answer from VDOC is that they are not blocking anyone's entrance to their businesses and what else they so do the, not so pay. the VDOC policy is typically there's only the claims that they address are those related to acquisition so there's no acquisition related with this project so for improvements they're required to provide reasonable access none of the entrances have been blocked and detours have been placed to show people how to get to the property um, internal circulation is actually 
um, to the parcel is responsibility of the owner. Um, if the owner needs any help with internal circulation, um, they can reach out to VDOT. But they cite um, several pages worth of case law that sets precedence for them not addressing any loss of business or any lost profits. And that's the state. I'm surprised. So we've addressed it, asked. <clears throat> We just need to keep, uh, keep on Kroger uh, corporate Mr. Morange uh, updated Rise. periodically. And I'll make sure that What's Mr. Kroger. So, 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 after, so after the meeting that we had right, right before Christmas, I think, I think it was, uh, reached out to their public information officer um, and made sure they were contacting the right individuals at Kroger. Um, we have another call scheduled for this week just to follow up on the conversation that we had uh, earlier. And so uh, we'll report back um, after I have that conversation. Uh, the completion date, uh, well, I don't have the completion date, but the opening of that intersection um, is scheduled towards, uh, this is weather dependent, the, the later part of February, first part of March. And that's, that's all going to depend on the, that's, that's weather, and it's going to be when they can put that course of asphalt down. So they can do the utility work, rebuild the road, it's just when they'll be able to put the asphalt down. Okay. Yes, those were the two. Uh, let's go to council ways, on, and I'll start with the question. I don't have anything. No, I don't have anything. I do. Yes. Um, okay. Um, first, I'll give the update on the uh, planning commission um, meeting uh, that I attended on the 16th. Um, it was UP 1716, that's the eight, um, 818 County Street uh, with the uh, water, water Group, uh, Bruce Watts. Um, we all know the properties right there at County and Effingham. They're proposing 59 apartments, mixed use, um, L-shaped building. We talked about it before. Um, the Planning Commission reviewed it. There were two registered speakers um, against it. One really didn't. No, um, but the planning commission approved it 5-1. Um, Commissioner Thompson was absent, and Commissioner Youngblood was the opposing uh, member. So this will come before us, and uh, we will have to make um, a determination as well. There was no opposition from the Westbury community. No one was there to speak in opposition uh, to it. And I've spoken to a couple people in that uh, resident, one being the Civic League president, and they thought that it was a good idea. Um, so uh, there will be no meeting in February. We'll convene again in March uh, with the Planning Commission. Uh, with the Ports and Redevelopment Housing Authority, um, had a real detailed meeting. Um, they had a couple resolutions that was writing off uncollected debt. Uh, for their public housing units and their assisted housing units. And um, I'll just give you the totals um, that were written off there. Um, let's see. Um, my question was well, how many were related to deaths, and there were three. Um, so for the assisted housing, they're writing off $13,120.82. And for the public housing, they're writing off $29,827. So this is uncollected rents that people didn't pay. Um, there was also some discussion about, um, I brought up about their meetings um, being in a more public place, and they're looking into their uh, recording and video uh, equipment, and they'll let us know about that when they have more information. Um, and they also had a concern that they go to our uh, Economic Development Authority meetings. I believe it's Elisa and um, Brian um, attend those meetings, but no one is coming to their meeting from um, Economic Development Authority. So they wanted to know who the representative or who the liaison would be to um, the PRHA meetings. If they meet in here, they don't need their equipment. Well, that was the report back. Mm -hmm. Can you communicate um, that request to the yes, sir? I will. Group, That's your a director, word. right? And Mrs. Um, uh, Mrs. The um, EDA, Alicia. Alicia. She's the one that attends. Mr. Donahue doesn't attend. Okay. The, right. But definitely, I will communicate okay. that tomorrow through Mr. Moore. Yeah. 
right in that chance. Alrighty. Um, could we, I know this is off the cuff, but could we get a status report on the uh, progress of the zoning re ordinance redo? Yeah, do you want that? Yeah. I mean, could, now? Can, you, can you give it now? Mr. Yeah, he can tell you where he is right now. <clears throat> Well, good evening, uh, Mayor Rowe, members of council. We'll give you a off-the-cuff uh, update on where we are. <clears throat> We've been working with our consulting team from the Berkeley Group. Um, the first order of business we had them do was um, go through the zoning ordinance looking for compliance with the state code requirements, and they've done a, a fairly large matrix kind of showing all the number of places where our code was out of compliance with the state code. And that's, those are the things that as we you know, craft the new code, we'll have to, and those are um, administrative type details, but they're uh, very important that the, we know all our um, zoning requirements be in line with what the state enabling legislature says. So we've completed that analysis. <clears throat> we've been working through the process of uh, establishing the outline uh, format uh, so we can start to you know, put the pieces together for the uh, way the ordinance is going to be re, re, uh, redrafted. Um, we have been doing uh, continued work in the D2 district. We are uh, currently working with VHB on a parking assessment. We're looking at uh, trying to craft parking that works with the existing land uses out there. As you know, some of those, some of the properties out there don't have any room for parking. Some places have plenty of room for parking. And we're also ass assessing the um, uh, potential need for a, a, a city-owned or municipally operated parking lot out there. Um, and so we're going through analysis doing that. Um, the uh, um, staff is, at the staff level, we're also doing something council asked us to do with the uh, Planning Commission City Council Retreat. We have started the process of, of analyzing the um, uh, small lots that uh, were being discussed, the way the, the current zoning ordinance um, uh, impacted the zoning districts, districts when it went through the process of, of uh, shrinking the number of overall zoning districts that we used to have compared to what we have now, what happened to the minimum lot sizes, what happened to the densities, what happened to the land use mixes. And so we've been crafting comparative analysis looking at that. And we're working with our GIS department so we can look at that in, in a map situation. <coughs> and we are moving closer towards the part where we will start uh, working with the uh, consultant first drafting, uh, the new definition section so we get our definitions cleaned up and straight. And then, and then we'll start working our way into the um, actual crafting of the of the new zoning ordinance. To my colleagues, we had a speaker last week um, that recommended that we look at a patch like we did on D2 mm -hmm. for the uh, subdivision of these lots. Is there a way that we could do that? Uh, very difficult because of the just the broad scope of what happened with these lots got done. We are taking a look at that. That's why we've started this analysis to see if there's some way to go back and, and craft that. And there's <clears throat> multiple um, multiple layers of issues we're going to have to work through. You know, location, historic you know, uh, lot patterns, all of those things. We are taking a look to see if there's something we can do short term uh, between now and the, the uh, completion date of the zoning order. So that's a pretty challenging task to do citywide. But we are looking at that. Well, that's still a concern, I assume, of everybody on council. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, when will we have a philosophical discussion about um, by right use versus conditional use permits? Well, as we begin crafting the new zoning districts, that's what we would like to get into. We have a number of issues we are setting aside that need some, we need, we'll need guidance from city council on. Uh, that being one of them, uh, conditional use, special use, by right uses. You know, we have that new category of special uses we're going to have in there. Uh, we'll be looking at having a, an, a new uh, site plan process for smaller projects that is missing from the current zoning ordinance. So we have a number of those things. Right now, it hasn't been scheduled far enough out for us to, to be prepared to come and have that conversation, but we are, in fact, crafting items for that discussion. Let me get Bill. Mayor, I would uh, suggest that we look uh, maybe at another one as well, and that's a block use. And, and the reason why I say that, with uh, Portside uh, coming on board, uh, we're going to have numerous uh, vendors uh, so a use, met, a use permit to operate a, a food concession or restaurant, uh, I, I think we should consider the facility as a whole, uh, which would be a block use. should be part of the discussion anyway. 
one quick talking about the uh, you know I mentioned possible patch and you know difficulties <clears throat> in it but a lot of these are they're subdividing the lots if I'm correct they're taking one large lot and subdividing them yeah. is there any way that you know who approves the subdivision of the lots or you know that, that's all done in the planning department and basically what we do when people come into sub let me kind of take you through the process a couple ways to help understand what we're looking at <clears throat> so we have you know created lots all over the city and and depending on when the lots were created in the location they're all various sizes um, the zoning ordinance unfortunately was adopted it, it crafted very small lot standards to be applied kind of across the board and obviously as people are starting to recognize that especially in some of the older neighborhoods they're recognizing they go and take maybe one lot and subdivide it into two or two lots into three and in some of these cases they're uh, you know taking houses out and demolishing and we're starting to hear uh, I'm sure as you're hearing uh, concerns about parking we're hearing concerns about incompatibility with the land use pattern of the neighborhood all of those things and and just because of the way the, the old zoning code and for those who've never looked at it it had a large number of residential districts we had a lot of, of breakout in the old zoning code and so by putting them all into into a, uh, just a handful what we have in the current code it's made this problem pretty much global and you can imagine you could take a uh, a lot that had a 10,000, look in the old code, a 10,000, 12,000, or 15,000 square foot lot. Now you might be able to get two or three lots out of that one lot. So you could go into a neighborhood, for example, and take one house out and get a couple of lots out of that. Some places it could be larger than that. So that's the complexity of the problem. When they come into our office, before we let them get a building permit, they have to properly subdivide the lot. Each house has to be on its own lot. And so we're going through, we're doing quite a number of uh, what we call minor subdivisions where we're either vacating lot lines or resetting new lot lines and and that's you know that's kind of the question to fall back on what was already stated i understand the difficulty of you know different neighborhoods different requirements but these are only happening in places that they're subdividing lots so is there some way we could put some kind of process on that subdivision yeah, well, to well, slow this down. Yeah, well, the the, sub, the, the way subdivision ordinances are, or um, authority is granted by the state, it's a ministerial function. It's an administrative function. We don't have any way to okay. stop people from subdividing. The way you get to that is craft better lot standards, and that's what we're working on now. If we can get something back quicker, we may want to come back to you and put some change in what's in the current code. Forget the new districts. Sure. Something in the current code as a holding pattern, and then come back and look at later on right now we're in fact, we're just discussing this this afternoon we expect we're going to have to add in at least you know one or two more districts to get at this problem but we may come back with something trying to go back to something closer to what the old code had if you may recall this was around when the um, city was annexing property they used to go to the largest lot when it would come into the city from the county so you had a lot of large lots we're looking at something moving more in that direction to try to put a Put these neighbors kind of back to where they were in in 2009 and but again because there's so many of these districts that were out there trying to get the right fit and and i know oh, sorry and i know that at uh you know this is you know i've noticed it citywide you know we had discussed you know the intersection of greenwood and uh deep creek boulevard mm -hmm. that area deep creek they've boulevard. been in port norfolk mary <laughs> mac point the speaker at the last meeting was from churchland mm -hmm. so this is it's all over the whole city mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. we are we are Correct. well aware Correct. of the problem yes, sir. <laughs> at, at the last meeting the, the issue of by right use permit came up mm -hmm. who defines that by right is that local or state that's that's done locally and it's done by city council in the zoning ordinance okay so you'll have if you look at a, our, our zoning table, um, and we're going to have a simpler one when we come back with them. If you look at the zoning table, when it goes through the different zoning districts, then they'll have a list of uses. Code also defines what's allowed under those uses. If you have a list of uses, then each one of those uses will have a code. We'll either have a permitted by right code or it requires a use permit. Mm -hmm. um, in that case, is city council decides how they want to so split they, those up. So they still have to come before us by right. No. no, they don't. No, no. by rights administrative. Okay. And so, for example, right now, all multifamily requires a use permit. That was a change made a couple of years ago, because under the 2009 code, all this multifamily was by right. So we did, um, if you want to call that a patch, we did a patch of that to go bring all that back to council, requiring a use permit. And that's the philosophical discussion that we have to have amongst ourselves to find out, you know, how much by right can we stomach <coughs> versus when you get to that type of development you need a conditional use permit 
What's an uh, example? Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. What's yeah. an example of a buy right that's already went up that we didn't, didn't require? A typical buy right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say almost anywhere in the city if you built a um, um, fast food restaurant. Forget what we had to deal with on the yeah. form-based code yeah. area, but if you were out on airline and want to put a McDonald's out there, that's going to be a buy right. You, until you put the drive-through in, yeah. drive-throughs then it'll trigger. This is the way this will work. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have to look at. So you know, a restaurant's a buy right. A drive-through triggers a use permit. If a Kroger a buy right. A Kroger pharmacy drive-through needs a use permit. If the restaurant has entertainment, is that buy right? Uh, entertainment depends on what the entertainment is. If you have amplified music. If you have, and we're working on that definition, trying to clean that up. But if you have live entertainment, like dancing, <laughs> DJ, bands, um, any of those things, those are all defined as entertainment and require use permits. Okay. If you're in there and you just have background music, so you're in an Olive Garden type of setting, that would not. Getting back to the residential question that we've been talking about, uh, first let me ask, what is the end date, when do you expect that we'll adopt the new ordinance? Uh, the, the ordinance as we, when we did the initial contract was 18 months from the date we started, which was July of 17. So, so end, of, end of uh, 2019. 2019. Mm -hmm. well, then or end of 2018. And then we've got, let me, let me we attack another four months on the back end because we're going to redo the subdivision ordinance behind it. So we're looking at mid-2019. For everything. For everything. Finished. Well, then... I think to get back to the question, is there a fix for the residential? I mean, is there a way to do this with a conditional use permit? No. That is not allowed. That is that's not one thing allowed. the state says you can't require use permits for single family okay. detached. So that's one place there's a state prohibition, a prohibition on uh, uh, regulating single family detached. But what can we do? Well, what we're going to do, we're going to go back and look at these lots. I think the, the proper temporary fix is to modify these lot standards in some fashion, even looking in the compressed districts we have now and look back. i give you an example of what happened, and, and it's unfortunate, but if you looked at, if we had three or four zoning districts that were being compressed into one, the current code took the smallest lot of, in those range of districts and made that the standard. So as you went to larger zoning, the smaller lot now prevails, and it was intended to increase density, and, and you're seeing sort of the results of that. So we have to go back and look at that and see is there a middle ground, and, and you can tweak some things and kind of get where you're trying to go without doing, you know, a whole lot. So if you pick a lot size, maybe a little bit larger, some of these, you know, very small lots we're getting. We're getting some very small, what I would call townhouse size lots for single family homes on it. And Wasn't so, it done for infill too? It was. Uh, it was done to encourage infill yeah. and to, and to yeah, one of the things, I mean, there's some philosophical, back to this question about having a philosophical discussion. One of the, one of the goals of the, uh, of the uh, zoning ordinance change was to get new housing built in the city that was, you know, more updated since we have, you know, a lot of older uh, housing stock. And so one of the, one of the ideas was you create smaller lots and get new housing on it. Obviously, did There's that. a balance in here between, you know, being compatible with their with the community, and creating opportunities to build new infill housing. To my colleagues on council, um, do we want to ask the city manager to develop a patch for this? If we've got a year left got, before yeah, some months, we did that patch pretty quickly last time. Right. We did it in four yeah. months. Is there a consensus yeah. yes. for that? I'd love to know if there's a way. Yeah. Doctor, I'm, I'm fine. Yeah. Okay. Well, we can get that. We can okay. move forward on that and come get it back to you. All right. Well, thank you for doing this on the fly. Any also, also um, it just remind you of my presentation last night, which ties into talking about housing. The city does not and has never had a housing plan, and I talked about that last night. And in this uh, budget, we'd like to propose that we start so that we can have a plan for development of housing and house, housing in the city. Dr. Patton, before yes, Christmas, we had the consultant in on the comprehensive plan. Yes. Uh, did everybody turn their their responses? Uh, we have two that will be coming in tomorrow. 
uh, and then everybody's is in. Mr. Smith just got his. He probably hadn't even seen it today. I emailed it to him earlier today. So we're asking Mr. Smith. I didn't mean to put anybody on the spot. No, you didn't. But, uh, you didn't yeah. put us on the spot. But I, it was sent to Mr. Smith today, and if you read it, I said I'll talk with you tonight. Mm -hmm. I will, and then the other person will get theirs in in the morning. So Mr. He will have them all. Yeah. And if I could ask a question, I think the the question we have on our side is what do you want us to do with those? Um, is there going to be a work session? You want us to bring those back before you can kind of go through your list? Is that what that you're looking for? Looking for a retreat. For okay, we just want to make sure we understand how you want us to bring this back. We've been you know, working as we go. Is that good with everyone? Sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. a summary of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, of what you, what you have. Mm -hmm. And then that goes on to the um, um, group that's working on the right, conference. Our, 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 our that's on track. I mean, yeah, the comprehensive plan's on track. We were definitely on Very track. On track. Uh, if you're interested in the schedule on that, Please. Um, we're expecting to have the draft uh, underway uh, uh, by the month of February. Mm -hmm. uh, within a couple of months, we'll have a draft for staff, initial staff review. And the target is to try to get this thing. I'm just giving you a, you know, we're really pushing on this thing, trying to get this to the Planning Commission in May and to Council in June. Our goal is to get through our project by the end of the fiscal year, which is what we started and, and promised to do. We've tried to keep on track. So the goal is new conference to plan in front of City Council by the end of the fiscal year. Okay. Very good. Any other? Oh, yes, sir. It's, it's not regarding this. Okay. It's just from yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, the, v, the VML resolution on the cell towers that we discussed yesterday mm -hmm. that was pulled, uh, my question is, will VML legal counsel be advising us on, as to uh, that language that we had an issue with? Uh, I, I have not reached out to them, but I can in the interim. Yeah. Would, be because I'm quite sure they, the, their legal counsel draft that resolution. We, uh, so. we, we had a discussion with Ms. Neal okay. today. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's some other than legal considerations in how that resolution was drafted. Well, okay. So I don't expect to be any concern about what we need to do in terms of modifying that language. It, it seems uh, there were some other uh, legislative issues that had gone on from last year to this year that precipitated that particular resolution. Okay. So I think there's some other non-legal matters that are but in it, but we'll check with them. VML is the point. We will check in with them and find out what those concerns were and, and address those when we come back. Okay. And we okay. had the conversation with Ms. Neal today. Okay. I was curious because I noticed the counsel, the attorney that was representing the sale company last week referenced the um, federal law in regards to health. Right. Yes. And I didn't, and that was contradictory to what was in the yeah, resolution. We believe. Yeah. Right. And that, so that's why I was challenge. curious if legal counsel. We couldn't believe it. I, I, and, and we will check behind it, but we do know that there, there probably were some other considerations in terms of how that was crafted. Okay. Okay. And um, my last question: um, at our last council meeting, the the funding that was approved uh, for the firemen uniform, the change out, mm -hmm. um, there. I believe in that ordinance it was something like a million dollars and then 300 and some thousand went to the city attorney mm -hmm. and then the balance was for the uniform. The total was one point something million. Right. Um, 370,000 was for legal right. and the other was for the um, um, uniform turn, turnaround gear and then other equipment was in there. It okay. listed all of the equipment that was in there okay. that was going to be for purchase. Okay. okay, I just want to make sure on, right. on that because it was reported, um, I think by Wavy, I saw, and, and the figure was different. Then. Okay, someone told me that it was on Wavy that right after that same night mm -hmm. and that that there was something different than what we said. We can pull that and see what, it, what they okay. did report and uh, just reach out and have Mr. Pace to correct that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Alrighty. We're good. You've got it, Mr. Right. Mm -hmm. We will adjourn and we'll eat and then reconvene for our regular session at 7. We're adjourned.